process looks like for you as a parent and also for your, your students. I'm also excited to see a few students in the audience. You know, they're going to be walking away most likely with loans um, and they're a big part of this process so I think it's really important that they're here to hear the information themselves as well and be a part of the process with us. So today we're going to hear from um, our illustrious presenter Michael Ellison and I want to introduce him to you. So he has been coming here to do this with us for now a few years, um, and he is a resident of Sturbridge in Holland for many years, and he has two daughters here, one at the high school and one at the junior high school, so he's very connected to our community, which is wonderful. He began working at Amherst College as the Assistant Dean of Financial Aid in 1999, and is currently the Associate Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, so he knows what he's talking about for sure. He's now in his 20th year at Amherst College, for prospective first and second year students. He manages the Pell Grant program, which he's going to talk about kind of more generally today. He also acts as an athletic liaison and supports diversity initiatives at the college, including working with the National Quest Bridge organization and presenting at the diversity open houses. So he's going to provide a wonderful overview of the financial aid process. You can certainly follow along. I encourage you to follow along on the PowerPoint. In addition to his um, presentation, there's a lot of other resources that are out there to help you with financial aid. If you choose to sign up for the MIFA emails, that's a great way to kind of stay connected to the financial aid process and get updates and links of resources. And so we'll talk about how to kind of connect yourself with that. There's also something called FAFSA Day. FAFSA Day is a wonderful opportunity where financial aid representatives are there to walk you through the entire FAFSA process if you feel that you're struggling on your own to, to get started. And I wanted to give you the two dates of the FAFSA days that are upcoming in Worcester, which is probably the closest from here. So on Saturday, November 17th, at Worcester State University at 1 p.m., you can register online. If you just type in FAFSA day into Google, it'll bring you to the website and you have to register for these events. And then you need to bring your 2017 taxes and your FSA ID, which Michael will be speaking about, which is that, that account for the FAFSA. The second FAFSA day that is around here in Worcester at Quinn Sigamon Community College is on Sunday, January 27th at 1 o'clock. So again, we have Saturday, November 17th at 1 o'clock at Worcester State. And then we have Sunday, January 27th at 1 o'clock at Quinn Sigmund Community College. So which, those are which college? The Worcester, the, the Worcester campus. Yep, the Worcester campus. So those are two opportunities where, again, you can bring your tax materials and your FSA ID. They'll give you a presentation about the FAFSA from start to finish, and then you'll sit down at a computer and actually go through it while financial aid representatives walk around and assist you with going through it. So that can be a wonderful opportunity. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Mr. Michael Ellison. Let's give him a warm, fantastic welcome. Thank you, everyone. It's nice for you to be here tonight. This information, while somewhat um, dry, I admit, uh, is really important for you to have really strong knowledge as you're going through this process. Financial aid is, in fact, a process. If this is your first student going through this process, it can feel a little uh, overwhelming or daunting. Just know that it is, in fact, a process. The more that you can uh, arm yourself with information and knowledge and vocabulary, the better off you're going to be overall in general. A little bit about MIFA. MIFA stands for the Massachusetts Educational Finance Authority. Uh, they have a number of speakers like myself that are financially professionals around the state. Can everybody hear me okay with that? You know what I mean? Uh, and what we do is we, we're trying to help families. MIFA helps families uh, plan and save and pay for college. Um, and they help me keep on track in terms of the college planning process. So MIFA.org is their, their website. Okay. Is their website. They also have a phone and, and uh, social media presence as well. On the evaluation form that you have, you can sign up for their emails. They have details about these seminars uh, on the events. So MIFA.org slash events page will actually have a copy of the, the uh, presentation that we're doing here today as well as the copy that you already have. And uh, for webinars, you can also go to that same page to get webinar information about uh, applying and the after the application process once you've already been admitted to colleges and you're figuring out how to pay after the fact. 
So today, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the types and the sources of A, and there's a number of those. We're going to talk about the application process itself. We're going to go through how different institutions will make financial decisions about uh, how the determination of aid is done. And as you're asking questions, um, you'll hear the first two words out of my mouth will be, it depends, because it depends. Um, it's a big difference from school to school to school as to their policies and procedures. So that's why it's really important for you to garner as much information as you possibly can about the list of schools that your, your children are looking at attending. We're talking about paying for college as well, and then we'll talk about some free resources that are, there, that are available for you as well. In terms of the types and the sources of aid, we basically have these three main groups and these types of aid that are available for all students. So uh, grants and scholarships are so-called gift aid. That's, of course, our favorite type of aid. It does not have to be repaid. It goes directly to reduce down how much you owe the institution that your children are attending. There's also work study. That could be either on the institutional uh, level or at the federal level as well. That usually represents the student's opportunity to work during the academic year, either on or off campus. Students typically get paid every couple of weeks for the hours that they work. They give them a little bit of pocket money just so they're not hitting up mom and dad for every single penny of their spending money as they're going through school. And then the vast majority of schools have student loans that are part of their financial aid awards as well. And we'll talk a little more in detail about that in just a moment. There are also loans that can be borrowed on the part of the parent. Well, so, whoa, 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 that's not me. I, I really, I'm not doing that. Oh, that's not helpful. Let's do this. Okay. Plan B. Reckon, reckon my whole, you know, all the, all the suspense is gone now. I'm charging what's in. Okay. Shall we continue? All right. So just nationally, this is giving me a very high level, 30,000 foot view of uh, the national scene in terms of financial aid. And this is from the College Board's trend in student aid from 2017. So in the 16-17 school year, there was about $181 billion of aid that was distributed nationally. And as you can see, the, the biggest sort of little blue one there is in the form of federal student loans. So again, the vast majority of schools do package student loans as part of their financial aid awards. So students and parents are, are it behooves you to become well-versed in all things student loans uh, and parent loans. Um, federal grants are also a pretty substantial amount, 21%. Institutional grants and scholarships make up a fairly substantial chunk at 25%. Again, it's going to vary wildly from institution to institution. Um, federal tax credits, when they were initially enacted, they weren't supposed to be considered financial aid, but you see that almost 10% of our $181 billion is not inconsequential. There's private grants that are out there as well, state grants, and federal work studies a relatively small amount of aid that's, that's available out there as well. So when we're talking about financial aid, we're going to talk about two distinct types. And so this is why you want to know, at your individual institution, do they offer merit-based money? Do they offer need-based money? Do they offer a combination of the two? So right now we'll talk about merit-based awards. So merit-based awards are going to, it's going to wildly differ from school to school, as I've mentioned before. Um, and it's usually awarded in terms of the recognition for a student achievement, whether it's an athletic event, or whether it's a uh, uh, prowess rather, or whether it's musical ability, whether there's uh, arts or what have you. Um, it's typically, it may or may not be renewable. It's going to differ from school to school. If it is renewable, you want to be very clear as to what the renewable, what the criteria are to renew eligibility for merit-based for merit-based aid. It typically is tied to a GPA. Uh, a grade point average. So typically a student's going to have to maintain a certain GPA to maintain eligibility for their merit-based award. It's not necessarily offered at every school. Some schools will do a combination of merit-based and need-based aid. Um, most of the time there will be a separate application required. Um, it's usually going to be part of the admission application, typically. And, and some of these deadlines are as early as a couple of weeks from now. So students that are getting um, up to speed in terms of financial aid and looking at the list of schools and narrowing down that list of schools, you definitely want to check the deadlines because it's really important. In terms of uh, merit-based award, the Abigail, the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship is one that's administered by the state of Massachusetts. That's based on the 10th grade MCAS scores. Students still have to complete a free application for federal student aid, FAFSA, to be eligible for that, and they do need to maintain a specific GPA of 3.0 to maintain eligibility. It is a uh, tuition-based, a tuition waiver for the John and Abigail Adams, but it doesn't waive the fees. 
So there'll still be some expense associated even if a student is lucky enough to be awarded this Abigail and John Adams scholarship. Just know that there are tuition and fees and this is a tuition waiver. And those letters are coming from the state um, in terms of who received them for the class of 2019 this month. So we'll be alerting your students who were the recipients hopefully the last week of October, first week of November. Excuse me, is that only once a year or does it happen in maybe January again? Or is it just this time of year? The state provides the list once. once. Um, and then sometimes if students move out of the senior class and the class size changes considerably, sometimes I've seen one time that one additional student was um, made eligible um, because they met the criteria and percentile cutoffs, but that typically does not happen. Thank you. Okay. And then we're going to compare and contrast relative to merit-based aid, the vast majority of aid that's administered, particularly at the state institutions, is need-based. So it's based on the students and the families' financial eligibility, we've demonstrated financial need. And it's usually determined by a standardized formula. So it's taking into account the cost of the individual institution, which again is going to vary whether you're at a community college or the state school or one of the private schools. And from that, they're going to subtract out your expected family contribution that gets calculated from all of your application materials. That difference between the two, the cost minus the family contribution, is the demonstrated need. Um, typically, the aid package that's going to meet that need is going to include a combination of grants. Again, our favorite type of aid goes directly to reduce the bill. There's also loans that are typically part of most of the schools' financial aid packages and work study. Um, most of the financial aid, as I mentioned, is in fact need-based, and it's going to be different from school to school to what extent that institution has the resources available to be able to meet the full need. So that's going to be different from school to school as well. And then a student to maintain eligibility for need-based financial aid also has to maintain satisfactory academic progress. And most of the time that's going to be that the school says, yes, you can come back next semester, you did fine this semester, keep up the good work. Generally speaking, it's going to be a C or better GPA average, so a 2.0 or better. And then there's also a number of credits attempted versus the number of credits completed criteria as well. So all those go into the satisfactory academic progress. So you don't want to overlook any sources of aid. There's a number of different sources of aid. There's aid at the federal level. In terms of grants, we're talking about federal Pell Grants, as well as the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, so-called SEOG. There's federal work study. There's student loans as well, and then those tax incentives that I was referring to earlier. Um, the IRS publication 970 gives you the details about the tax incentives. And the website is this studentaid.gov. Sure thing. If I, does it help if I look at you as well? Okay, sure. And then the state of Massachusetts also has aid that's available in the form of grants and scholarships, so the Mass Grant. There's also different tuition waivers depending upon um, students, uh, parents' employment per chance. There are also loans that are available through the state of Massachusetts. One of the best one is the no interest loan, and just like it sounds, it carries a 0% interest rate. Not every school has that type of funding. Um, it's a limited resource because it's through the state of Massachusetts. But this website, mass.edu slash OSFA, Office of Student Financial Aid, will give you some details about that. And then typically, depending upon the institution that you're looking at, there's a fairly substantial amount of uh, college or institutional aid as well that's available. And that can be in the form of grants and scholarships as well as loans. And some schools have their own work programs as well. And then you want to not overlook any of the outside agencies that have scholarship eligibility as well and offer up scholarship funds. What you don't want to do is you don't want to pay anybody, you know, just send $99 before midnight tonight to fill out the scholarship application. Your students are incredibly talented when it comes to the internet and, and using the technology and the resources that are available. So they can spend an hour or two searching for scholarships that, of course, you don't have to pay for. So, uh, Ms. Kendall, would you like to speak a little bit about the opportunities that are here at Tantasco? Yep. So we have a lot of scholarships that do become available throughout the course of the year for students. And Mr. Hinckley will be, is emailing those out via Naviance to students. Um, so to say, this is the scholarship that just came in, here are the requirements, here's either the link for the application or the hard copy is down in guidance. So students should be on Naviance looking at those emails and those notifications to make sure that no scholarships you know, are passing them by that they might be qualified for. 
The other bigger piece of the scholarship puzzle for us is the local scholarship process. If you've attended class night in the spring, you will see that across the stage we have students walking, um, walking across and getting money from about 75 community organizations who support our students every, every year. And that local scholarship process begins in February. So we meet with the students um, in the second week of February, right before February vacation. We go over the local scholarship process. We give them the scholarship um, information so they can start working on those applications over February vacation. And then they turn in those completed applications in March. Um, the decisions are made by the community organizations and then they're awarded on class night. And again, we have about 75 community organizations every year who support us through scholarships. And so my recommendation would be that every student can absolutely find at least at least one scholarship that they would qualify for and should apply for in the local scholarship process. One other thing about outside scholarships and, and private scholarships like this is you do want to be aware of each of the institution's outside scholarship policies and how they treat outside scholarships. So the federal government requires that each school take into account outside scholarships within the financial aid award. So it's not going to reduce your family contribution typically. But it's up to the individual institutions what part of the financial aid award gets replaced. So some schools will take it right off of their own scholarship. Nice essay on your part, you just save the institution $1,000. No net benefit to the student at all. Some schools will take half off of their scholarship, half off the self-help, the work, and the loans. And other schools will take it off of the least advantageous type of aid as well. So it differs from school to school, so you want to be aware of what those policies are. It's much more critical when you're talking about schools that meet the full financial need of their students. Typically, if there's unmet need as part of the financial aid award, schools will allow it to first fill that unmet need before impacting any of the financial aid award. But it's a good question to ask during the course of your college research now. You definitely want to be aware of each institution's policy, how they handle outside scholarships. So we're moving on to um, student loans. So this is, a, again, a really important, this used to be further back in the presentation, but it's, it's really important, so I've moved it up by quite a bit. Um, again, the vast majority of schools do have student loans as part of their financial aid awards. This is, these are the types of loans where uh, it's only predicated on the student being a student. So as long as the student is enrolled at least half time, they would have eligibility to take advantage of student loans. So it's one where the student is the borrower, so the parents are not on the hook for these student loans at all. There's no credit check against predicated on being a student. There are both subsidized, which is interest-free while the student's enrolled in school, typically up through and including six months after graduation. And if the student enrolls in graduate school or professional school, that's interest-free during that time as well. There are also unsubsidized student loans, which are considered non-need-based, so they're regarded as replacing part of the family contribution. The difference between the two, of course, is that the interest is accruing on the unsubsidized loan from the time the money's dispersed to the student. The student's not required to make any payments while they're enrolled in school, but the interest is accruing on an unsubsidized loan. For this current academic year that we're in right now, the interest rate is 5.05%. So again, you're not required to make any payments while the student's enrolled. There are many different repayment options that are available. So depending upon the career path or and or employment opportunities upon graduation, if a student is working in, in, a, in a, either a field or can find a job where it's relatively modest in terms of income, there are different repayment options that help knock down the amount of required payment. So if a student borrowed the full $27,000, so the loan limits increase as you progress through school, if the student borrowed the maximum for all four years, that would be that $27,000 figure. At the standard repayment of 10 years, it would be about $300 a month. Now, again, if a student is, is making $15,000 when they graduate and they're you know, in a rigid, relatively low-paying job, they have other repayment options that are income-based by the borrower. So it could be that they borrow uh, you know, this amount of money, and if they're having very modest income when they graduate, they could be required to pay far less on a monthly basis than this. So it's tied to the student's income. It's called income-based repayment. And there's a lot of information that would be coming for students as they're doing the borrowing. Uh, part of the uh, rights and responsibilities of so-called entrance counseling at the beginning when the student has first borrowed talks about all these different options. And so again, deferment means that it's completely not required to be making any payments. Forbearance would be where it's an interest-only type of payment. 
And depending upon different programs and different careers that students go into, there may be forgiveness opportunities that are there as well. So what I, what I really encourage is that your student reads all the fine print, you read all the fine print if you're doing any borrowing. Don't just have your student walk into the financial aid office and go, yeah, 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 where do I sign? And kind of blindly not pay attention, okay, this is my second year of borrowing, I've now accumulated X dollars in debt, that translates to X dollars per month when I graduate. It's really important to keep track of indebtedness and know the amount that that's going to end up encumbering your future income. Okay, how do we actually go through the application process? So the big thing is the dates and the deadlines. So you really want to pay close attention to all of the dates and all of the deadlines. At some schools, it's not as important. At other schools, it's critically important. I've worked at an institution before that literally, if you were one day late on your financial aid application, you took yourself out 40% of the scholarship money you would otherwise be considered for. So at some schools it's not a big deal, at other schools it's a really big deal. So you want to be aware of the earliest deadlines and make sure that you're meeting the earliest deadlines. The applications now are available as of October 1st, and so you can actually complete next year's application, the 1919-1920 school year application, right now. So um, by signing up for the MIFA.org emails, they'll send you out this great college application manager that helps to, to manage the entire process, especially when you're looking at multiple schools. One thing that you want to remember as well is that if you have multiple children attending college, each student is a unique applicant. So you'll have to do a lot of duplication of the exact same information financially, but you'll have a separate application for each of the students that is looking to enroll. Okay, so first, every school in the country requires a free application for federal student aid. The emphasis on free. So again, don't pay anybody to do your financial aid application. As we'll talk about a little later, the FAFSA day gives you the opportunity to have financial aid professionals like myself help you to fill out the forms. You have your tax returns in your hand. You have to have the FSAID, which is about halfway down the slide. And it became available again as of October 1st. Um, they are new. You can actually do it on a mobile applicant application as well. You can do that on a mobile device, which is new this year. The FSAID is very important. So one of the parents that's completing the application will have to have an FSAID. Likewise, the student will have to have an FSA ID. That serves as your electronic signature for everything that you do with the Department of Education. So that would also count as your FAFSA signature. It also counts for signing promissory notes for student loans and or parent loans. So you want to keep um, your FSA ID uh, close and, and available to yourself. You don't want to lose it. It does become uh, quite a hassle, from my understanding, to retrieve a new FSA ID. So you want to keep it in a safe place and know where you put it. The other thing that I would definitely emphasize is this IRS data retrieval tool. So this is where you have the opportunity to present itself as you're doing the application itself, and it will say, would you like us to transfer your IRS ta tax data over into your FAFSA? The answer is yes, you do. It, it masks the data as the transfer is taking place, but when we talk about the output documents that you get after doing the application, you'll see all the data that, that got transferred over. Um, if your student is selected for verification, which is about 30% of all applicants nationally, you'll have to provide either a tax transcript or complete this FSA, um, the, the data retrieval tool, the DRT. That's the thing about financial aid, right? We can go through entire paragraphs and not use whole words. We can just use acronyms everywhere. So the more you're familiar with the language, the better off you're going to be. So by doing this DRT, that satisfies the income documentation requirement for federal verification. Okay, and so it's really going to, it's a great time saver, and it's uh, much less of a hassle to try to contact the IRS to get a federal tax transcript. There's usually quite a several week delay for that to happen. Again, there's, yes? It, this may have just gone over my head. Where do you find this? Where do you go for that, the IRS? Where you're doing your FAFSA form, it will because be presented to you. So the question, the question that's being asked is, where do you go to find the data retrieval tool information? It will be on that website. When you go to the FAFSA.gov and you start completing your FAFSA, when you get to the parent information, if you indicate that you've completed a tax return, it will, it will prompt you and ask you if you would like that IRS information to be retrieved and transferred over to the FAFSA form. Thank you. Sure. And again, uh, the FAFSA is a form that has to be completed every year. 
And uh, each, each year, a school will make a new determination of eligibility and repackage a new financial aid award for you. So the stuff that gets reported on the FAFSA, first leads your citizenship status of the student. Uh, the colleges to which the student is applying, you can list up to 10 schools on the FAFSA form. When you get your output document back, if you need to amend your list of schools, you make a correction to your FAFSA data, and you remove one of the schools and replace it with a new school. And you can do that as many times as you need to satisfy all the schools that you're applying to. In terms of parents, it's looking for um, their information. So it's going to be looking for parent information. Um, whether if, you're, if your parents are married, even if they're same-sex parents, they're going to be looking for both, both parents' information. Even if your folks are not married uh, but live together, they'll be both parts of information getting put on the form as well. In the case of divorced or separated parents, the only parent that completes the form is the custodial parent. If that custodial parent has remarried, it's custodial parent and step parent. Really important. It's going to look at income information. So for the 1920 FAFSA form, that's going to be looking at 2017 income information. And that consists of both taxed as well as untaxed income. An example of untaxed income would be child support received from a non-custodial parent. It could also mean pre-tax contributions to retirement. Those are usually going to show up on box 12 of your W-2 forms. You don't want to include the contributions that your employer makes to your health insurance. That's code DD. But basically, all the other codes that show up in box 12 uh, do need to be reported as other untaxed income. The directions are pretty specific. They're pretty clear. You should follow them closely on that one. Then they're going to look at parent and student assets. So they're going to be looking at cash, savings, and checking accounts. Um, investments, so CDs, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, those things that are not held in a retirement plan, but are just regular assets that you have. And uh, 529 plans are the asset of the owner of the plan. So if you as the parent own the plan and your student is the beneficiary, that gets reported as a parent asset. If another family member has a 529 plan for your student and your student's the beneficiary, that does not get reported as an asset on the form. So, the FAFSA form ignores completely the primary uh, residence altogether. It doesn't look at any retirement accounts whatsoever. It ignores life insurance and small businesses with fewer than uh, 100 employees. So those are all excluded from this application. But it, what's very important are the number of the household members and more importantly, the number of children attending college. That's a huge variable that drives the expected family contribution. So if when you did the form initially, you thought that a sibling was going to be enrolled, but it turns out that they're not going to be enrolled, you want to make sure that you share that with the school as soon as you're aware of that, because it does greatly change your eligibility. Conversely, if you thought that the sibling was not going to be enrolled, but it turns out to be enrolled, you definitely want to inform the financial aid office about that, because again, it's going to lower your family contribution and increase your eligibility. So those are very big variables. How are we doing so far? Everybody with me so far? Yeah? Okay. I know this stuff is really exciting, and it's really, really fun, but it's really important. So other schools, like mine, will require not only the FAFSA, so the FAFSA is, the, is used to determine eligibility for all federal aid, federal work study, federal Pell Grants, supplemental grants, student loan eligibility. And many of the state schools will also use just that one form, the FAFSA, to determine eligibility for their own institutional funds. Other schools that have substantial institutional money that they want to award themselves will require a second form, this CSS profile form. It's not required by all schools. Again, you want to check the websites typically of the individual institutions that you're applying to and see what exactly the application requirements are. This is a fee-based school. It's $25 to do the form and it's $16 for each additional school being listed there. If you qualify for a fee waiver, from completing the form, they'll notify you as you complete the form that you don't have to make any payment. And it's unlimited in terms of the number of schools that the fee can be waived for, which is different for this year than previous years. That also became available as of the 1st of October. The cssprofile.org is their website. Generally speaking, schools that require this form are going to be looking, at least at the outset, at uh, looking for both of the biological parents' information, if that's not safe. If that's not reasonable, every school typically has a petition where you can ask that the non-custodial parent be waived. Usually that requires a third party, a disinterested third party letter to accompany the student's statement. 
And sometimes this is, this is kind of dicey material we're talking about here. So I would encourage the student to be very forthcoming if they're gonna do one of these petitions. It's not always an easy thing. It can dredge up some bad memories, but by the same token, somebody's gonna have to sit behind the desk and make a determination to say, yep, we're gonna waive that parent, or no, we're gonna continue to expect the information from that parent. So um, the third party disinterested letter is not mom or dad's lawyer, it's not Aunt Sally, it's a therapist. It's a clergy member. It might be a police report. It could be a court order, restraining order, something like that. And generally speaking, if it's that kind of traumatic for the student that it's really you know, not safe, not reasonable to expect the student to contact that non-custodial parent, it's going to be waived. Again, at uh, mifa.org slash events, they provide details on these questions about the profile. And then some schools will also require their own institutional application as well. Again, it's going to differ from school to school. You'd want to check on that. A lot of the institutional applications may be part of the admissions packet as well. So you want to be really clear as to not only the application materials, but again, those deadlines. Really important. Okay, so after you apply, by indicating the school on the two different forms, the schools get that information electronically from the processor. The, in terms of the FAFSA, the student will get back what's called a student aid report, or SAR. And if the student has provided an email address, it will be emailed to them. If the student didn't provide an email address, it will come by actual mail. And it will summarize all the information that you put on the application. The FAFSA form allows you the opportunity to make corrections. You can do that online, or you can do it if you've got a paper student aid report, you can do it that way. 99.9% .9 of the people in the world these days do it online. If you have special circumstances, changing circumstances, unusual circumstances, you want to make sure that you're communicating that to the individual financial aid offices with which you're working. Um, again, as we talked about the verification process, uh, many schools will consider your application incomplete until those verification pro uh, documents come in. That's typically going to consist of a federal verification worksheet where you itemize down the family members and if you've indicated that there's more than one child attending college, where they're attending college, and when they expect to graduate. Again, many, many schools would consider the application incomplete if that verification document hasn't been received. And this is, again, the benefit of doing the data retrieval tool instead of having to obtain a uh, IRS tax transcript. So then what happens is the individual schools will review all those application materials, they'll compare that to their cost of attendance, and they'll make a determination of your financial aid eligibility, and they'll put together a financial aid package that will attempt to meet their full financial need to the extent that they're able, and it will consist of the different items that, that make up the financial aid package. Again, different from school to school. So, how did this all go? How does it get made? So the cost of attendance, or student expense budget, you'll hear those two terms used interchangeably. This is what they're basing the, the financial aid upon. So the cost of attendance typically is gonna be higher than the amount of the annual bill from the college because it consists of both the bill or direct expenses that you do get the bill from the college for the tuition and the fees and the room and board if the student's going to live on campus and then there are also going to be indirect expenses that you don't get a bill from the institution for them but the school knows that you'll incur these expenses by virtue of having a student like books and supplies transportation and personal expenses and those again they can vary a little bit and you can knock down especially the indirect expenses by buying used books by you know, trimming down your personal expenses and so forth. So that's just what they determine and base your financial aid upon is the combination of all of these. So you add those all up, that's the cost of attendance or student expense budget. Now, what happens is the family contribution, the expected family contribution, or EFC, gets calculated from all the application materials. So for some schools, it's gonna be just the FAFSA form. Other schools, it's gonna be the FAFSA, the profile, and tax returns. So. The family contribution, it's important to know, is not a measure of extra cash at the end of the year, month, week. It's a measure of the family's ability to absorb educational costs over time. Um, some schools will also use an institutional formula. And, and basically, the expected family contribution, when you get that calculation, that's really the minimum that you're going to have to pay, depending upon the institution that you're looking at. Um, and again, the family contribution gets adjusted if you have more than one child in college. So every college in the country, every financial aid office in the country is required to have a net price calculator on their website. And so it's a good idea for planning purposes, especially when we're talking about, you know, it's almost a year from now before your child is gonna be enrolled. 
for you to do these calculators that are available. And there's a number of them. You don't have to particularly use these, but they're, they're good ones. And what's good about them is you can put in some what-if scenarios as well. So here's my 2017 income information, straight vanilla, right down the middle of the road. But what if the following year my income goes up by 10%? What if my income goes down by 10%? What if we expend some assets to be paying for school? What if we're fortunate and we um, inherit some money or what have you? You can play some what-if scenarios and see how it impacts the bottom line. What if we have two children attending college next year instead of just one this year? So these are good ways to start the planning process and to start the conversation as to what's a, a financially manageable agreement and commitment that you can make with your student and vice versa. So it's important to have these conversations as early as possible. You don't want to start these conversations next August when the bill is due. That's a little too late. So as I said, there's these great uh, net price calculators that are available as well. Um, and they, they bring a bunch of information. They'll ask you, they'll walk you through both the taxable as well as the untaxed income questions like that. It provides a, an estimated family contribution, and by definition, the net price is the total cost of attendance, or student expense budget that we just looked at, minus just the grant aid. That'll be your net price. So that, that way a student does not have to necessarily take advantage of the work opportunity or take the student loans, but you'll see what the price would be without those items. And then if you do decide to take a student loan, that'll reduce down that, that overall price. They will ask some personal questions too, so some schools may include their merit-based awards based on what the student responded in terms of their activities and their achievements. It's gonna be different from school to school. So again, what we do is we take out in terms of the need-based financial aid formula, they take the cost of attendance, or student expense budget. From that, they subtract out your expected family contribution. That equals your demonstrated financial aid eligibility, or demonstrated financial need. And then each individual school will attempt to meet that uh, as best as it can with their available resources. So what we're looking at here is the asset impact on the expected family contribution. So those of you that have saved for college, excellent, good for you. Um, the impact by doing so is a lot less than a change in income. So in this example, we've got three families, families A, B, and C. They all have similar income at $75,000. Family A has no assets. And so their calculated family contribution based on next year's federal methodology with four in the family and one in college is about $7,400. Now in family B, the income stays the same. The assets increase by $75,000, not inconsequential. But you can see that the family contribution, the EFC, is only a little more than $10,000 or an increase of about $2,700. Even though it's a $75,000 increase in assets. And then family C goes up to $150,000 in assets. Their expected family contribution is just under $14,500. And that's an increase of just under $7,000. So all this is to show and illustrate that increases in assets don't have ginormous increases in the expected family contribution. So those of you that have saved for college, worry not. By doing so, you've given yourself a lot of flexibility and options as to how you're going to actually pay for school. Compare and contrast with the income impact on the expected family contribution. So both the federal methodology as well as the institutional methodology are far more income sensitive than asset sensitive, up or down. So in this example here, we have family A that's got $75,000 of income. They have 50,000 in assets. Their family contribution comes up to just under $8,800. Now family B, the assets stay the same, but now the income has gone up only $25,000 to $100,000, yet the family contribution increases by that $8,500 up to the $17,300 figure. So a pretty substantial increase. And then if the family income on family C goes to $150,000, you can see that that's a $33,000 family contribution, an increase of $24,000 for only a doubling of the income. So again, what you want to pull away from these two slides, both of the formulas are more income sensitive than asset sensitive. Assets would be the things like cash savings and checking accounts, non-retirement assets, so CDs, stocks, mutual funds, precious metals, things like that. Things like that in general. And this is going to be combined uh, taxable and untaxed income when we're, when we're talking about measuring income. So even though your adjusted gross income might be one number, the school might define your income a little, a little differently because of the untaxed, for example, the pre-tax contributions to retirement that I was talking about before. Yes, but your portion, it becomes, that's part of your total income. So, so the 401k contributions to retirement 
get added into the total income, their, their untaxed income, and they become part of the total income. Are you with me so far on that? So again, more income sensitive than asset sensitive. And so in terms of uh, the cost of attendance on, on our uh, y-axis and uh, the different schools on our x-axis, so um, you've got four different schools, four different costs. In this case, the, the expected family contribution is the same in the blue at $5,000 for each of the institutions. And the eligibility is the green difference between the total cost of attendance and the expected family contribution. And this slide really is just trying to get you to look at, uh, don't rule out the expensive schools because they look expensive when you look at the, the um, cost of attendance, right? Most of the most expensive schools are gonna have the most generous aid programs. So if you go to a more expensive school, if you can get into a more expensive school, very often they're gonna have more generous aid packages. That doesn't mean that school D is, is a bad school by any means. It's, you know, if it's a local community college or what have you, it's a great way to be able to get a couple of years under your belt at a relatively low cost. And then there's transfer programs that you can take advantage of moving into the state universities as well. Uh, basically the exact same thing. So this is, now the empty bucket is the cost of attendance. So for you visual learners here. So the cost of attendance is $45,000. The family contribution is that same 5,000 that we were just talking about. So that's the first part of filling up the bucket. At this institution, they were able to give some scholarship for that $9,500, the grant for the $15,500, student loans for $5,500, work study for $2,000. But this particular institution didn't have the resources to be able to meet the full need, which in our example would have been $40,000, right? The cost of attendance of $45,000 minus the family's $5,000 contribution. So there's an unmet need. Now again, if you receive an outside scholarship, the vast majority of schools are gonna say, yep, you can fill up that unmet need with outside scholarships. But if, this, if the student didn't get any outside scholarships and this is what the aid package looked like, it's really the expected family contribution of the $5,000 plus the unmet need of $7,500 is really gonna be that family's responsibility at that institution. This is why it's different from school to school and it always depends, right? So when you get the award letter from the institution, so what they're gonna do is send you an award, send your student an award. Everything gets sent to the student in the student's name. So when the parent calls up and says, I just wanna find out what my daughter Susie got, you're gonna get stonewalled and be like, you gotta to talk to your student. And the vast majority of schools now use portals as opposed to a paper award letter to provide you this information. So the, we've got these three schools that all had the same cost of attendance at $45,000. The expected family contribution is $5,000. So their total eligibility at all three schools is $40,000. Now College A, they were able to be pretty generous. They put in some uh, $32,500 in the form of scholarships. They also had student loans in $5,500 and work study for $2,000. So they met the full need of the $40,000. They had no unmet need at that particular institution. College B, <coughs> They did the best that they could. They came up with 25,500 in the form of scholarship. They also did the student loans at the maximum of 5,500 as a first year student. The student work study was also at 2,000. So their total aid eligibility that they were able to meet was $33,000. So that left $7,000 of unmet need. So at that institution, the family's gonna be responsible for the $5,000 family contribution plus that $7,000 of unmet need. Okay, so the school C, they had some scholarship eligibility, they had some student loans, they had some work study. That totaled up to $25,000. They had $15,000 of unmet need. So this family at that school is gonna pay more like 20,000 to meet the full cost of that attendance. It's different from school to school. The aid packages are different from school to school. So the totals can vary on an award letter. Uh, or again, most schools use financial aid portals. As a first year student, so, yes. So we talked about subsidized and unsubsidized yeah. loans. So the maximum first year subsidized loan limit is $3,500 and you can get as much as another $2,000 in the unsubsidized loan for a total of the 5,500. Okay. That progresses up as you progress, as your student progresses through school. So the subsidized portion starts at 3,500, second year maximum goes to 4,500, third and fourth year maximums go to 5,500. So with the unsubsidized on top, it would be 5,500, 6,500, 
7,500, 7,500. And the vast majority of schools, again, will package student loans, and the vast majority of schools will follow those loan limit increases when they're making their packages each year. Not uncommon. So the other thing that I would want you to look at, was there another question? The other thing that I want you to look at is not only the, the totals of the awards, but the types of aid in the award, right? Because schools can do all kinds of funny little things to make it look like we've met the exact same need. The total of aid of all three of these schools looks like it's the same. But as you can see, the granted scholarship difference is not the same. So you not only want to look at the totals, you don't want to just look at, oh, the total aid that he got was $35,000. You want to look at the pieces that make up the total. And in this example, we've got college aid, they did the grants and scholarships, they did the student loans, they didn't package any parent loans. Parent loans generally are non-need based. They're usually credit based, but they don't go to meeting any of the need at the individual institution because they're non-need based. They're regarded as replacing your family contribution. So, school A, college A, with a total of 35,000, still has a $5,000 unmet need, but they have a $27,500 scholarship. College B, they have $10,000 lower in the scholarship, the money that we like the most, because that goes directly to the bill to reduce down how much you owe, it doesn't have to be repaid. They have student loans as well. Now they put in a parent loan for $10,000. That's a non-need based type of aid. They still show up with $5,000 of unmet need. It still looks like they awarded $35,000 total in aid. But as you can see, they've got a $10,000 parent loan. College C's put in, they've got no grants or scholarships and they're financially awarded. They crank the student loans up to $5,500 maximum as a first year student. They also now put in a $29,500 parent loan to make it look like they're awarding you $35,000 of aid. So I would call college B and college C a little on the unscrupulous side of things. It's not very, um, you'd want to make sure that you read the fine print when you get the awards so that you're making sure that you're not being sort of duped into thinking that you're getting the same amount of money for all three colleges when clearly the amount that's going towards the bill that doesn't have to be paid is dramatically different at these three institutions. So this is a really important point I can't emphasize enough. Okay, so now that we've given you the doom and gloom, how are we going to actually make it happen? There's no one right way, there's no wrong way. It's going to be different from family to family to family. So depending on the resources of the family, it's going to matter a lot as to how the strategy is formulated as to how we're going to actually pay the bill and, and send our child off to college. So some families are in a position that they do have assets, they can use their past income of either themselves, themselves or their student out of their savings. Right? In this example, they're using $1,500 out of the student's savings account and the parents are kicking in $4,000 total to this. The total balance due is $20,000 on the top right. Other families will take advantage of their present income and take advantage of payment plans. Most schools have payment plans, so most of the schools in Massachusetts are on a semester basis, and so instead of one large payment for each semester, you can split that up over maybe five payments per semester. Again, it's going to differ from school to school. And some families will take advantage of encumbering their, their future income in the form of the student loans that we talked about. And again, the vast majority of schools are going to include student loans as part of their financial aid boards, and or parent loans. This is, of course, where Mifa would want me to tell you to take a Mifa loan. Um, and if you are borrowing as a parent, you do want to investigate and look carefully at the federal parent loans that are available, as well as these MIFA loans, because they do garner a little stronger applicant pool, because they do a little more stringent application process with the MIFA loan. And so sometimes they'll have a little bit lower interest rate. So it's worth, it's worth your time to at least investigate and compare and contrast the different borrowing that you have. And if you are gonna borrow, of course, again, I just emphasize, read the fine print, know what the interest rate is, know what the standard repayment terms are, and what flexibility you have in terms of repayment. Okay, other things that you definitely want to keep, keep in mind. Uh, you definitely want to consider the number of children that are going to be going to college, right? Because if you're starting off with this is your first child in college, again, in subsequent years, if you have multiple kids in college, your family contribution gets divided by the number of children in college. So if you've got a two-year overlap, say, and you've got two years of one child in college, and then two years of two kids in college, and then two years of one child in college again, it's going to be expensive, it's going to decrease, then it's going to get expensive again. So that's one of the biggest variables that drives the expected family contribution. Think in terms of the total enrollment, whether the student's going to a two-year school or a four-year school, 
always keep in mind the total debt that the student is getting into. You definitely can't emphasize that enough. You know what that means in terms of your post-graduation monthly payment. It may make the difference whether your student is able to buy a car or start a family or buy a house if they have heavy student loan payments. Um, they should definitely be looking at what their career interests are and whether they're going to be able to afford to pay back their student loans. Again, we have that income-based repayment that does take into account for lower starting salaries. Is your student gradu considering graduate or professional school? Student loans are deferrable during that time. Know your credit score, especially if you're gonna borrow a private loan. Again, you'd wanna maximize your student's federal loan eligibility always before going to any alternative types of loans. And there are a number of private lenders that are out there. Generally speaking, those are gonna be credit-based, whereas the federal loans are not credit-based. They're just precluded on the student being a student. And most of the time, they're going to require a co-signer because most of our 17-year-olds don't have any credit yet. So before you co-sign a private loan at 14, 15, 16 percent, you would want to investigate taking your own parent loan at more like 7 percent, right? It only makes sense financially. So again, what you want to do is, is look at the, the school's net price after financial aid offers are received so you have a basis of comparison. Again, as we just talked about a couple of slides ago, you want to make sure that you're looking not only at the totals, but the type of aid that's offered to your student. And then there's these great options that are available. Now, I admit, um, while I do admissions at my school, I don't do a lot with transfers for uh, community colleges. But there are some great opportunities that students can get their first couple of years at community colleges at a, at a much reduced price. And then there are these different programs where they can, they can um, transfer to the, to the universities around, around the state. So this uh, A to B degree is, is a guaranteed credit transfer, so you're not losing classes that you've already taken. Um, they transfer from your community college to the four-year public. There's no application fee, there's no essay required. Um, you're basically guaranteed admission, and your tuition credit is based on your GPA. They have these other great programs as well with the Commonwealth Commitment. That's where you go from a community college to one of the uh, public four years as well. That also doesn't have an application fee or, a, or an essay. You're guaranteed admission based on your GPA. And what's interesting is you also get a credit based on if you maintain a 3.0 GPA or better. So this is a great way. And then the tuition break is for those programs that are not offered here in Massachusetts. The New England Board of Higher Education, NEBHG, um, offers discounts. So if a program is not offered in Massachusetts, but it is offered in Vermont, you can go to the Vermont school and pay the in-state tuition and likewise throughout the states of New England. So it, it's that's again for programs that aren't offered in Massachusetts. But it's a great way to be able to save some money and, and uh, still get to be able to graduate from one of the four-year universities here in Massachusetts. Okay, hey, free resources. Uh, the financial aid office, of course. So you definitely want to create a relationship with the financial aid offices of which your uh, student is applying. So you want to find out again, in terms of that aid program, at that institution. Um, it was, what's the renewability criteria? Is it based on the GPA? Is it based on other academic criteria? Um, you definitely want to ask about the outside scholarships, private scholarships. You want to ask about the treatment of that. You want to ask about uh, special circumstances. So, you know, I applied for aid and then I lost my job. So next year's income is going to be a lot lower than the income that we're looking at, which is two-year-old income. Um, can I appeal the award? How do I go about doing that? Does it have to be in writing or is a phone call enough? It's always going to have to be in writing, right? Because a, a committee of sorts is going to have to look at what you're appealing. You want to not only um, say, this is too much, but more importantly, you want to say, these are my unique or individual circumstances. We have unusually high medical expenses. And last year, we paid X. We support our extended family, like aunts and uncles or grandparents. And last year, we gave them $2,000, whatever it is. You want to not only indicate what the circumstances are, but quantify the dollar figures. If you're uh, paying for private school tuition, things like that, you'd want to make sure that individual aid offices were, about, were aware of that. You want to find out uh, about open house programs or orientation programs. Do they have those during the application process? Can you get a chance for your student to go and visit that school and have a program where they put on, you know, panel discussions and talk to students and so forth and so on? And then, of course, you want to definitely look at all your financial resources that are available. So you want to make sure um, that you're really familiar with the individual aid offices that your students are looking at. Maybe you narrow it down to their top few, but you want to be really familiar again with what the application process is, what the application materials required are, what the dates are. Um, again, if it's convenient to you, you could request an in-person meeting. 
most of the time an email or a phone call is just, just as uh, well received at the individual aid offices. Then you want to look at your community resources and your national resources as well. So FAFSA Day, um, as we talked about here a couple of minutes ago, gives you the opportunity to, to go to a location where you have the ability to fill out uh, the FAFSA itself with professionals there assisting you along the way. You'd want to make sure that you have your FSA ID for yourself and your student. And you want to make sure that you have your 2017 income tax information, just the federal tax return. Again, those are different locations. Um, the FAFSAday.org site will give you other alternatives in addition to the Whistler sites that we've heard about as well. There are uh, EOCs, Educational Opportunity Centers, where they can give you free financial aid help as well. And then for terms of scholarships, um, these are three that I would encourage you to look at. Um, they're they're going to be free. They're going to give you different resources based on the criteria that you put in, the selection criteria, and they'll give you a number of resources and scholarships that you can apply for. Again, don't pay anybody to do these searches. Totally unnecessary. So, um, MIFA also provides after the college acceptance seminars. So it gives you information about how to interpret the financial aid award, how, to, how the college bill is going to be uh, formulated and how that's going to be paid by the amounts of aid that are in the financial aid award at that point, payment plan, college loans, what to ask the financial aid office. And again, those are after the acceptance, most regular decision acceptances, March and April. Most of the time you have to reply by May 1st as to where you're going. So these give you the opportunity during those couple of months to compare different financial aid awards and get some help in terms of that. So again, by registering for the MIFA emails, they'll send you help, all the information about these after their college acceptance seminars. They also have online webinar, webinars as well, so you don't have to necessarily physically go there. They have this stuff available online as well. So, your follow-up, your homework. Sign up for the MIFA emails. It's super helpful. Go ahead and apply now for your FSA ID if you haven't already done so. Again, keep it in a safe place where you know where you can access it. Make sure you're aware of the deadlines of each of your institutions. Make sure you're aware of what the application materials are. Sign up for those webinars and start completing your applications. That's going to be about the long and the short of it. So that's me. Uh, I would be happy to answer questions for you. If you're thinking a question, there's at least five other people in the room that are thinking the same question. So you're really helping out the group by asking your general question. If you have a much more personal question that you'd like to ask individually, um, I will be available up here at the end and I will answer those types of questions as well. Without my microphone. Yeah, you basically delay the whole thing by about a year. Okay. Yeah, so if your student's going to take a, a, a year off or a gap year, um, they will do the exact same application process. It's just a year later. The tax information will be a year later. The forms will all be a year later. And the same process, but generally the same process will take place. Not necessarily. I mean, it's going to depend on the individual institution. But a, a lot of schools also... Uh, provide the opportunity for the student to apply, get accepted, and then say to them, I'm going to take a year off, I'm going to take a gap year, but I'm going to come back next year, and I would like to still come to your school if you'll, if you'll keep my acceptance in place. That's going to be from school to school as well. And then again, they're going to make a new determination, especially as it relates to need-based aid, they're going to make a new determination of eligibility each year. So while well, they may have awarded that student for the first year, but if the student doesn't enroll, that package goes away basically and it gets redetermined the following year. That's a good question. Yes? So the question is, what's the difference between the FAFSA form and the profile form? There's a ton of duplication. So they're going to be asking for a lot of the exact same information, the basic differences are going to be um, the home equity question. Um, and the profile form does ask for the total of retirement assets, but it typically doesn't get used within the calculation at all. So that's, I mean, there's a ton of duplication. You can be asking for very much the same things. So if you have your tax return in hand, it's literally going to say, 
take line 31 and put it in this box, take line 56 and put it in this box. So it's not, it's not that daunting. And, and if you are looking at a school that's going to require the profile, because both forms are available now, I recommend you do them virtually at the same time. I would, uh, so the question is, um, there was a, a family that, that this questioner was asking about that said that they did the FAFSA form and got a financial aid award from their school, but then subsequently were told that they had to complete the CSS profile form and their aid got reduced as a result. So my, my school requires both forms. If we only have the FAFSA form and don't have the profile form, that application is incomplete and the student's not getting awarded aid. So that's why I would say that's probably not likely. Because the, most schools would not award, if they require the profile, they're not going to make an award without the profile form being completed. There are general differences between the FAFSA and the profile. And you usually, if you do own a home and you have some equity in your home, the profile calculation might be a little bit higher than the FAFSA calculation. But the behind the um, home equity comes into play on the profile form. That doesn't come into play on the facts of form. So there could be a difference in those two resulting calculations, especially if the family has some home equity. Home equity, by definition, is the value of the home minus the debt against the home, all the debt against the home. So first mortgages, second mortgages, line of credit, all those that are tied to the home. So you might get a little difference between those. The behind the scenes tables, if you will, with the percentages of the calculations are slightly different too. So they're not going to be wildly, wildly, crazily different, but they could be slightly different. It's the current market value of the home. So the question is, where does the home value come from? Um, no school is going to say you have to hire a professional real estate appraiser to come and appraise your home. There are a couple of decent websites that get you pretty warm. Zillow.com is one. It's, it's, it's a, a good faith estimate, is what it is. You don't usually want to use your tax assessed value, because that's usually a little less than the um, fair market value. But you've you got to be warm to it. You know, you've got to be warm to it. If you bought your house in 1971 for you know, $70,000, and you say it's worth $71,000 now in 2018, you might, you might get a little inquiry on that one. What else? Other questions? You've got plenty of time. But if you're done, you're done. That's okay. All right, so like I said, um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, please do fill out those evaluations. And you can leave them on the table up in the back. Um, I will be available up here for a few more minutes if anybody has more personal questions that they don't want the microphone to be shared with. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for coming. And again, arm yourself with information. This is what it's all about. <laughs>